general manager of uh, Nexon Group China. We have, of course, our uh, friend Michael Kwan, chairman of uh, Kwan Capital Holding Limited, and CCG Vice Chairman, CCG Shanghai Council Chairman. We have, uh, of course, our uh, distinguished Michael Naveen, recipient of uh, 2013 Nobel Prize in Chemistry, a member of the National Academy of Science, professor of uh, structure biology at uh, Stanford University. We have also Ms. Liu uh, Chong, Liu Chun, Executive Director and the Vice President of uh, Dong Hu International. Uh, Mr. Liu is our wonderful host for today's uh, uh, the club. Also, we have uh, Dr. Miao Lu, uh, co-founder of uh, CCG, Secretary General of uh, CCG. We have uh, Mr. Ming Hao, Chairman of uh, Nanjing East Horse Electric Company Limited, also CCG Senior Council Member. We also have uh, Si Yang, Chief Economics of uh, Honghui Asset Management, CCG uh, Vice Chairman. We have uh, Jonathan, uh, the Dean of uh, McKinsey Global Institute. We have Dr. Srivas uh, Ramantra, Chief Compliance Officer of uh, New Development Bank. We have uh, Mr. Zhao Guanbing, Senior Economics of uh, PwC, also Deputy Secretary General of uh, CCG Shanghai Council. Of course, we have uh, uh, Madam, the G General Manager of uh, Shanghai Town and City Club. It is our great pleasure to have uh, everybody join us here. Uh, it is uh, my pleasure to invite Dr. Wan to give us a welcome address. Thank you. Thank you, Liu Hong. Thank you, CCG Director and our President. This is a very exciting event. Uh, since we are having an international uh, launch, I'm going to uh, speak in English. So, uh, dear Professor uh, Nobel Laureate Michael Levine and uh, our distinguished uh, uh, guests, uh, uh, CCG Council members, and our friends and, uh, uh, in Shanghai. So, it's really a great uh, uh, honor for us to welcome all of you, uh, also together with our uh, uh, town and country club, we have our town and country club uh, general manager, uh, uh, President Mr. Liu is also present here today. It's, it's really a great event. We are having an a offline <laughs> event basically uh, in Shanghai. It's the first time CCG having this offline event in Shanghai. So we're very, very uh, pleased to welcome. You we have our local our Shanghai chapter uh, uh, President uh, Guan Xin uh, with us also today. So it's really uh, uh, very important. We have so many uh, uh, you know, distinguished guests attending this event. As we all know that uh, you know, 2020 will go down in history as a very uh, you know, challenging, turbulent, and memorable year. And we also know that uh, uh, you know, in a few days time, we'll, we'll, we'll have a lot of changes uh, happening around the world. China is actually now, today, uh, the, the, the government is having its uh, uh, plenary committee to decide in the next uh, 14, five years plan. And uh, so we're having so many things coming up and uh, at, at, at this approaching the end of the year. But CCG is a, is a think tank. It's the, uh, we, it's, our full name is the Center for China and Globalization, if our friends are not uh, uh, too familiar with that. It has been established for the last uh, uh, over 12 years. And now we have been three years in a row has been uh, ranked as the top 100 think tanks in the world. Uh, so we have uh, also uh, been very active in China. 
And one of the things we do is really to organize an academic event, a social event, and business event like this. It really mixes people from academic, uh, government of officials, and also uh, 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 business community. Uh, for example, we are very lucky we have a Council General of Singapore, uh, uh, Mr. Chai, is with us also today. So, so this is really a, a very interesting event. We want to uh, um, have more these kind of exchanges. We want to uh, uh, pick your brain. You know, we also want to let people know that uh, uh, you know we have a, a very uh, exciting, uh, very uh, 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 forward-looking uh, speakers. I mean, particularly uh, our Nobel laureates, and uh, and the CCG, of course, is uh, is willing to build this platform. And we hope we'll have more of these kind of activities uh, as time goes on and as, as time China gets back to normal. And uh, we hope that uh, we'll welcome you uh, uh, in Shanghai and all in Beijing. And uh, uh, for example, in Beijing on the, on the 11 of, uh, of Beijing, we have already uh, a, a, a two, uh, we have several webinars uh, on the 11 of November. We already secured uh, uh, the speakers like uh, uh, Graham Allison, uh, who's the Harvard professor. He's famous for the he hit his trap. We have secured uh, Thomas Friedman, who is the uh, very famous, uh, 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 you know, uh, writer of the New York Times. And also we secured uh, Pascal Ami, the former WTO uh, uh, the, the, the president, uh, direct DJ. And so we have a, a number of. Uh, this thing with pan panelists will be joining us on 11 uh, in Beijing, but on the 12, we're having a, an offline event. We have a ambassador roundtable, we have a chamber president roundtable, we have a, a business roundtable, NGO roundtable, so a variety of roundtable. You can check our, our website or our WeChat. We'll also be having McKenzie uh, making a special uh, presentation at our forum as well. So, so it's a great event. We want to welcome you in Beijing as well. So I don't think I, I, I would like to, uh, I, would, I will uh, take too much of our time. We'll leave to our, our very important uh, guests. And, and after that, we'll have a panel discussion uh, to talk about all the issues that you may concern or you may be interested. So once again, I want to welcome all of you. I want to also uh, thank our, our live audience. We have actually carried this on, on some of our social media uh, portals. So, uh, so it's, uh, it's really a, a, a very uh, interesting time. A lot of people want to know the, the intellectual community very much look forward to this exchange event. So we want to thank also the uh, Town and Country Club uh, for hosting us and uh, I would really appreciate all your presence. Thank you very much. So now it's our great pleasure to welcome Professor Michael Labie to share his uh, perspective. So we, we have, uh, because of lunching, uh, uh, Mr. Lavit said, we are sitting a bit of this. Uh, it is better for uh, the audience here can directly communicate with him rather than him give a, a 30 minutes lecture. Uh, he has a very wide interest. You can ask him any subject you want, except uh, uh, Today, you know, some of like a COVID questions that I've been asking so many uh, times already. So uh, I'll be uh, 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 ask a few questions of Professor. Uh, I know Professor for the last two years. Uh, I think we look up to Nobel Prize winners like God. But the first time I met him, I most felt he's a person not only with intelligence, but it has ability 
to find good people, good things, and differences, and very, very friendly. Uh, so over the last two years, we have talked many, many different uh, subjects. And every time I brought uh, a question to him, and uh, he surprises me. So you can ask, what's the three best places for coffee today? He probably has a better answer than all of us. So with that, and uh, I hope uh, we give a big welcome to Professor Lavit. Thank you very much, Michael. I'll just say a few words of introduction, and then we can have questions. So in, in many ways, I'm a, a one-man global corporation because I've lived for at least 10 years in four different countries. I was born in South Africa, educated initially in Great Britain, then in Israel, and finally I'm in the USA. Uh, in between, we probably spent three or four months at hundreds of places. So uh, I really am very much uh, internationalist, a globalist. Um, I'm also somebody who is very unusual, but I like sports, but I don't like sports teams. And I'm very happy to watch any sport and appreciate the moves from either side, but I don't really care who wins. And this is something which I actually explained to Laura Ingraham on Fox News, and she was very surprised to hear this, but it's true. I mean, I honestly, and the reason is, is that uh, I give sports teams as an analogy. If you have two sports teams, they're probably analogous. In one year, one team might be better than the other team, but there's no real fundamental reason why one would like one group versus another group. But people become very passionate about sports, and I find this passion, which is often carried over to politics, um, often is not the best way to understand what's going on. So uh, in, in terms of questions, I, I have uh, set myself a, a self-imposed moratorium not to speak about the US elections for the next uh, eight days. Uh, I stopped tweeting about anything to do with the USA to avoid any kind of impression. Um, but again, it's been very interesting to see just how polit politicized something like COVID-19 has become. Um, I'm happy to, towards the end of this discussion, perhaps to have some discussion with COVID. I'm actually, I've actually agreed to make my first announcement on COVID or my first speeches about COVID in China at a meeting that's being held in Shanghai towards the end of this week, and I don't want to uh, be in violation of a contract. Um, but, you know, I, I am otherwise happy to speak about almost anything, and I'm sure I will answer a question about COVID, but not initiate a question on COVID. So uh, over to you, Michael. Thank you. So I'm going to start with something very easy and moving on to, uh, since we have not had lunch yet, uh, I think I'm making a history because my son actually uh, beat me to interview Professor Lavit early in the night and appeared in Shanghai television. So uh, he grant him this opportunity uh, because his love for the younger generations. So you've been to many countries and you have uh, I mean, three kids, right? Uh, do you have a first impression of Chinese kids, Chinese young students? Are they different? Are they same? Are they diversified? Uh, so so my, my first impressions of, of young Chinese people came from colleagues that I met in the United States. Um, my, every, every scientist in the US has many group members who come from China. I remember my first uh, group member was uh, a young person who had joined another group and decided he wanted to work in my group. And the professor of the other group said, this person literally is one in a billion. So this is something you can't say about other countries. And he was superb. Um, you know, I think that uh, firstly, there are two aspects here. One is young people and the other is young people from China. I think that and this might seem like a revolution these days, 
that young people are the future. A lot of people think that 80 year olds are the future and they might be the future for the next three or four years, but young people are the future. This has really come up very clearly uh, in the crisis we've had where a life is a life. No one has thought about years of life lost or disability that years of life lost. And I have a grandson who's 17. When he was 10, he asked me, would I like to live forever? And I said, mm, interesting idea. The trouble is, is if I live forever, then everybody lives forever. I, I can't be special. And if everyone lives forever, it means no more young people. And quite frankly, I'd much rather die and have young people than live forever and not have young people. And I think that's a question that everyone has to ask themselves. Also from a biological point of view, once we are past reproductive age, the only reason that old men and women are on Earth is to help young ones. Evolution kept us around with a longer lifespan because on average, having a grandparent or a senior helps younger people survive. So I think it's important for us to realize. So I'm a great believer in young people. Um, this is something which I also feel that a baby boomer like me has been super privileged. We came into a world wanting new people, wanting young people, wanting development. Everything was given to us. And then we forgot that we've got all this and we're not giving the same things to people coming after us. So uh, in terms of Chinese, the first thing I think that, uh, you know, uh, China has the most diversified cuisine in the world by a huge factor. Uh, diversified regional languages in an amazing way. I'm sure that young people are absolutely as diversified. And I think, as I hope we talk about later, diversification is a very important aspect of any, any sensible life. So, uh, coming back to uh, uh, education and young people, uh, you already help in Fudan, helping schools to uh, advance science here, especially in, uh, uh, in biology side. So if you compare to what education you got, uh, I believe that you are related with four schools, Stanford, Wiseman, Cambridge, uh, which is the other one, maybe Fudan. Uh, can you compare a little bit of our education system or learning uh, addict or learning uh, uh, tradition? And how can we as a society to help produce more your type of winners? Okay, so... Uh so learning, in fact, is a, is a conversation around the dinner, breakfast, and lunch table in our house because my wife, Shoshan, sitting here, uh, spent most of her life in teaching literacy and education and other aspects. Now she's a curator of Chinese art, which is also one of the reasons why I'm in China a lot. But education is very, very tricky. I think, uh, so my first requirement for school that when you, learn, you leave school, you shouldn't hate learning. So any school that doesn't kill any love for learning you might have had as a five-year-old is already somewhat successful. Now that's a, a very low bar, and everyone would say, that's just stupid, no, no school should kill learning. But the point is, is that I love learning. You know, I, 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 and I, didn't, I didn't go to a good school. I went to a school in South Africa, uh, and I skipped and I left quite quickly. But basically, but I had wonderful friends there. That school was for, for social aspects, and I loved learning. Today, I still love learning. You know, I, you know, I see Chinese scripts in the museum, and I, I get very excited. And it, quite frankly, I think there's nothing that doesn't interest me. I mean, literally, you know, there's a joke that if it didn't interest me, then it would be interesting, which doesn't interest me. Um, so everything interests me. So I think the first thing is that one should love learning. Learning is a lifelong thing. Um, I think that uh, my education has been very chaotic. Um, I came from a school, that, it turns out it's the same school that Elon Musk went to. Pretoria uh, Boys High School in South Africa. Um, but, uh, you know, I feel that education needs to keep people thinking. I'm a little bit worried about some aspects of uh, the very formal approach to Chinese university admissions. 
We're literally the top thousand going to Shawar and the next thousand we can go to Beidah and the next thousand we can go to And I would say that's fine, but if I could start to modify this, I would add some randomness. Randomness is a very, very powerful driver of all the truth. It's one of the things that I think scientists realize, other people don't, you know, some of the most important discoveries are made serendipitously, but randomness is a very powerful driver. So, for example, maybe you should say that 80% get admitted according to the score, and then you give away 20% random, or somewhere. Because I think oftentimes, I think, I think that we can choose is misplaced. And anyone who looked at my life would say, how did I go from a rather poor school in South Africa, and within five years be doing a PhD in Cambridge, uh, essentially doing the work that ended up getting me to Stockholm, seems completely ridiculous. But the fact is, there's a lot of chance of this. And I think we need to build randomness into the system. Um, it's not easy, because we all want things to be controlled. But mathematicians know how to control randomness. One of the things we do in, in a lot of algorithms. So I think that uh, this is something we need to be concerned about. Um, I think China has enormous potential. There is no country in the world that has more young people. That's a very simple statement. It's true. So I think China can do all the amazing Extremely important in China and something that I wish existed in the West. Uh, you know, when I go to Stanford, no one votes for me. I go to Stanford because I've been to Cambridge, I've got this, I wrote these papers, etc. Or when you get a Nobel Prize, no one votes for you. When you are a top heart surgeon, it's not because you get lots of votes or lots of likes or have lots of friends on Facebook. It's because you've demonstrated skill. And it's very, very sad to me that the top leaders in many countries got there democratically, and that might be useful, but without demonstrating any real skill other than to get elected. And this is not, it's, it's true in many, many countries, and this I think is a huge, huge negative. I don't think I would fly in an airline where the pilot was voted for. And I certainly wouldn't like my heart surgeon to be the most popular guy on the block. And believe me, Professors who've got him because they're popular are not the ones you want. There has to be critical thinking. Um, on the other hand, I'm now on Twitter, and I'm really happy to have 72,000 followers in five months, but that's nonsense compared to any kind of real qualification. China, I think, traditionally, for many, many millennia, has been educating people to lead. Leading is very, very hard. It's much harder to be a leader than a mathematician or a computer scientist, or a physicist. People don't realize that, but it's much harder. And we have to train people, teach people, in the specialities that are needed for leadership. And I think in this area, China has actually led the world, not just recently, but we were in a museum in, in Ningbo on the weekends, and we saw a library that has been erected to the imperial exams. And imperial exams have been recorded for more than a thousand years. So. This is what needs to happen. So I think there needs to be general global reform of education. I, I would say one other thing. You could say that a teacher is forbidden to teach anything. You can find in Beidou, Baidu or Gu. If you can find it there, they're not allowed to teach it. That would give teachers a lot of challenging thoughts. How do, what do we teach? We teach literacy. We teach methods. We don't teach information. So I think there are a lot of things that have to happen. Um, these, are, these are all issues that are not China, they're global. I think they're going to happen. I'm very optimistic, but we don't know now. Well, that was uh, randomness and uh, leadership and also individual uh, intelligence pursuit. So uh, let me ask you a question. So when you... Uh, working in Shanghai with 30 million people here. Uh, first of all, is Shanghai your favorite city? Because I'm, you know. I, I, I have no favorite cities. I have no favorite food stuff. I don't have a favorite sports team. So, you know, I mean. You have a favorite coffee shops 
I, that's true. Espresso, I have been. That's, a, that's serious. Yeah. Okay, can you tell us the story of uh, anybody drink espresso? David, you drink espresso? Professor can tell you which one is in Shanghai is the best. And he has his own way. I just asked him, right? Uh, so Shanghai, I mean, coffee is very difficult. I mean, basically, you can go to almost any coffee shop in Naples, but almost nowhere else in the world and get good coffee. So, I mean, you know, people say, oh, what's the coffee like in, in Venice? Awful. Uh, because espresso is very difficult. It has to be strong, but not bitter and not sour. And it turns out that you need different coffee when you have milk or not milk. So uh, there's a whole issue here, and it probably explains the success of, of uh, Nespresso and Nescafe. But in, in, in Shanghai, I, I have looked. They have the biggest, most fancy Starbucks, but you don't go there for coffee. Uh, more recently, there's been Manor Coffee, which is actually okay for cappuccino. It's much too sour for espresso. There's a small place on Lao Chongqing Road in Changi, right under Yandai, that has the best coffee that I have found so far in Shanghai. So uh, this is going to be the thing, if you like espresso, this is what you remember. If you're ever in New York City, there's a place called Zebeto. That's the only one. So it's very, very hard to get good coffee. Um, sorry. I, I organized a breakfast uh, with uh, Mr. Lavi. How about that? Okay, so actually I forgot what I was going to ask you. <laughs> um, anybody has a question, Zhang Zhao? So, okay, uh, maybe maybe open uh, uh, questions from Mr. Dong. So, thank you, Professor Lavi. Really pre pleasure to see you in person here in the post-COVID world. I was doubting that whether we see you in person or not or online. So um, post-COVID, the world changed. That's a fact. We are not going to argue about that. And post-COVID, we should behave differently. That's a fact that we should not be arguing about that, neither. As leaders here, whatever field he or she is in, there'll be so many things we should do differently. We will not argue about that, neither. However, what is the one thing that we have not thought about or have not fully think through that we should differently, that you should be aware, make us aware of around the world so that we can be better leaders, better, res more responsible social uh, citizens of the world. Uh, something that your wisdom will be very much appreciated. Thank you very much. Um, I should just say as a kind of introduction, that I have been working on, on COVID nonstop since the 26th of January. And my wife will say, I say about 10 hours a day, she will say 15 hours a day, but literally. Hundreds of pages written, thousands of programs, millions of graphs. So I'm very aware of COVID. And what scares me about COVID is not the virus or the disease. What scares me is, is that we've almost like uh, society is a piece of cloth. We've allowed somebody to come along with a knife and just slash the cloth. And everything is different because people have decided to use COVID as an excuse to make it different. Perhaps inadvertently, I don't want to, I'm not a conspiracy theory person at all, but if you actually look at COVID rationally uh, and take the numbers on COVID just quickly. So to date, I think about 1.2 million people are reported to have died of COVID. So that sounds like a big number until you realize that every day on earth, 150,000 people die. So 1.2 million is eight days of natural, normal death. Now we can even go further and say, how old are the people? who are dying from COVID. And basically the people who are dying of COVID, certainly in the West, about half are over 85 years old. So basically if you do something called uh, life potential adjusted years or something like that, if you get, it's like years of life lost, you find out that the total number of years lost to COVID is one fifty thousandth 
of all the years we have. So for a loss of life, it's like you have a, in your bank account $50,000 and suddenly $1 goes out of that. But if you decide to close your bank down because of that, you have something wrong with you. But essentially, human life on Earth has, you know, just take 8 billion and multiply it by various things, you'll get a certain amount of life. Well, basically, one fifty thousandth of that has been lost to COVID. Yet we prepared to change everything. And I think that this is for a number of very, very strange reasons. Um, I think the reasons are all very complicated. Um, the 2003 SARS was traumatic in East Asia, although the loss of life was basically less than motor vehicles in Shanghai in two days or something. In China, 200 people died from, from SARS-203. Um, the way we detect COVID is very strange. Every other disease, you go to a doctor and you say, I feel sick. And the doctor says, okay, well, breathe for me, you know, touch you here. COVID, they test you to see whether on your body is a certain RNA of a virus. The, the virus might be dead, the, the RNA might be broken, the testing might be super amplif amplifying, but it's a little bit like saying if you wear a gray tie, you have COVID, and if you don't wear a gray tie, you don't. Now, that's another problem. No other disease is detected this way. So these things all change a lot about the disease, but I think the disease may be three times more severe than flu. It may only be 20% more than flu. But the fact is, is that the global burden of death, one dollar out of 50,000, is not something that deserves this kind of treatment. But we have got the treatment. And my own feeling is that the way to behave is to try really, really hard to get back to how things used to be. Uh, the, the world worked pretty well. You know, I kind of like being able to fly wherever I wanted. And I kind of like walking in, in, in shopping arcades. I like actually talking to people. I mean, I do a lot of Zoom conferencing or Zomo conferencing or Movo conferencing, whatever name you'd like. But basically, it's not the same thing. Um, I'm really happy to be here in person, not because it's good for you. But when I look at the audience, you guys are giving me energy. I'm getting, there's a huge amount of empathy coming in. It's telling me what the answers are. But telling me what the questions are. And this is something we can't afford to give up. So I think before we decide to redesign the world, let's just, let, let's just see what happens. I think that, uh, you know, my own belief is, is that the biology of, of COVID is, I think we're lucky that COVID is a mutation of a cold virus and not the mutation of influenza. Because influenza really is a nasty virus. It's designed to mutate quickly. It's designed to be very original and creative as a virus, which makes it also very destructive. So I think that we will be fine. We don't know yet. We still have a winter coming up. Um, we see very strange phenomena in Europe of massive numbers of cases, but no deaths. And that's very surprising. I mean, you know, what is it? I mean, it, I, I also keep on asking myself, imagine during the flu season, we had a PCR test for flu. My guess is you would find that 10% of the people test positive because flu is endemic. So then would 10% of the deaths be flu related? No. I think we need to ask certain common sense of questions. I would like very much for things to go back. And, and one of the reasons why we made a special effort to come back to China as soon as we could, and it wasn't easy. The, the air fares are astronomical. Um, it took us three days to get here. Um, and it's normally an eight hour flight. Um, and quarantine is not fun. Um, you know, it's a good time for introspection and it was wonderful that we were together, but also difficult, I think. Uh, you know, uh, but I'm really pleased. I, mean, I would say another thing about uh, this coronavirus pandemic is that corona is what's called a contrast agent. In microscopy, and like microscopy, you can take cells and you put like an orange dye on them, and suddenly you see all the details. So I think for society, COVID has been a contrast agent 
revealing what was in society, defects, cracks, that we didn't notice before. So this has to be seen as an opportunity. It's a little bit like you had a, maybe a Salesforce system. This has been a stress test for society. And now the smart thing is to learn from everything we've seen to prepare ourselves to go forward. To follow on that, that, that was a great, great question. I, I, I think uh, um, to uh, maybe we cannot change in the world, we cannot change influenza, we probably cannot control it. But from our side, human side, we can change our behavior. Whether we're going to have more synthetic food, more clean air, uh, better hygiene. You know, I noticed that Chinese hospital visit since COVID is reduced a lot. That means people are a little bit healthy. Now, from your field, um, biology side or quantum biology side, which we don't know, how that world is approaching this? You think uh, AI intelligence or all kinds of intelligence or a complex of biology uh, will change that part of the world? So, uh, you know, I'm glad you brought up AI because it's interesting that before COVID, the first question was always AI. And now the first question is not AI. Um, but I think AI is very important. I, I see AI, and I didn't see this before. I see, saw AI before as self-driving cars, um, maybe manufacturing. If you like manufacturing, that would be epidemic proof because it wouldn't be done by human beings. Um, I also see as a side issue that besides AI, the whole issue of global warming for me is a very real issue. Um, there's no doubt that climate is changing and this, that's a serious problem. If you look at any of the estimates, that's, that will make COVID look like one out of 50,000 as it really is. But leaving that aside, I think that uh, where AI, AI is becoming very important, I think is to augment human thinking. The fact is, is that most people have really not been very smart in this, in this COVID period. I mean, uh, you know, you ask people, well, it's such a terrible disease. How many of your friends have died from COVID? Do you know people? And there are obviously people who are getting COVID, but equally well, people get flu. So um, it turned out that uh, one thing I was hoping for, and this is something that has been a long time in gestation before we had all the interest in AI, we had the IBM computer Watson that could play Jeopardy, this television game where you have to guess the question, given the answer, better than a human being. And this was maybe 10 years ago. And I remember being at a meeting and there was a person from IBM at the meeting. And I asked this person, what I would really like to happen is that every world leader would have a machine like this next to them. And there would be a law where you had to, you didn't have to do what the machine said, but you had to ask the machine the question. And the answer would be recorded. So people would say, you know, Watson said, not a good idea to invade Iraq. Okay, you might decide I want to invade Iraq. You're the president, you should do what you like. But the answer would be recorded. Because I think that one thing we have learned from AI, so there used to be a time when if a person knew how to get from point A to point B in London, or Shanghai, he was really smart. No longer is that a good question. You open your phone and the guidance tells you exactly how you go from A to B. It stops, it has stopped a great number of husband-wife arguments. The husband wants to go one way, the wife wants to go a different way. Nowadays, we just simply listen to the computer and do what they say. So one thing I thought that could be very helpful is in a future crisis, perhaps we could simply pick up our phones and literally say, and this is going to, activate, it's going to activate my phone, hey Google, Alexa, Siri, should I panic? And the phone would give you an answer that you would believe. And that answer would be way better than any news channel, any newspaper, or anything. It would tell you exactly why you should or should not panic. It would say, well, you can panic, but the total cost of the death is one in a hundred thousand. Is that what you want to panic about? Fine. But we need to have the numbers because it's clear to me that, and I said this in the audience, the one group that I think were very, very level-headed in COVID were the financial markets. Very early on, 
in March when I started to be more publicized, they immediately wrote to me asking for how I was doing things. And I said, it's very obvious. Just look at the numbers. There's nothing magic here. There's no assumptions. You basically, it's like you follow a stock. You basically think, hopefully, that tomorrow will be like yesterday, but with certain coming in things. And everything quietens down. And I think that that is something which we need to be able to have much more widely spread. I think the level of innumeracy, lack of numeracy, shown by major newspapers, the best newspapers in the world, has been shocking. I mean, there was an article in the New York Times, which is my favorite newspaper, that basically said that in the country whose name I won't mention, there has been a loss of life equivalent to two and a half million life years. And that sounds enormous until you realize that it's one fifty thousandth of all the life years in that country. So anyone would have said, well, this sounds like a big number, but, and we always need to put numbers into context. I mean, I'm sure, so I think there's been a lot of lack of sensibility. I think common sense needs to come back. Very good. Applaud for Professor Lavit. Now, we have other, more questions. So I'm gonna invite a few guests onto the stage so they can ask a question directly and also open up for questions for yourself. Please, Puyao, uh, Hayo, uh, Gerald, and you can have questions. So what is your question, please? Thanks, Professor Seth, and it was a pleasure uh, listening to you. Uh, I have one uh, uh, quick question. You mentioned about uh, randomness and serendipity uh, is the key for innovation. And in my opinion, the serendipity and randomness will come if some person has a multidisciplinary or an interdisciplinary approach. Uh, so someone who is an expert in his own field but doesn't uh, look out to other fields may not serendipitously come out to identify something. But in previous times, all our scientific innovations were preceded by this interdisciplinary with key focus on philosophical inquiries. We have Aristotle, Copernicus, Galileo. Everyone has been completely immersed in philosophy before they made out their contributions. Now, my question is, do you think currently the science has been completely delinked from philosophy and is becoming a... And do you think... AI can make a difference to this trend of detachment of science to philosophy. And if yes, do you think what role the Asian philosophy has to play in bridging the gap between science and philosophy? When I say Asian philosophy, the beliefs that hierarchical societies matter, rituals are important, and spiritual and moralistic mindset is key to success. Such kind of Asian philosophy in the age of AI Will it matter? Thank you. Thank you. Um, that was a long question, and I'm not sure I, I got all of it, but I think I, I get the general, the general direction. So I think that, uh, you know, the world is interdisciplinary. Everything matters. Everything is connected. I think the distinction between chemistry, physics, mathematics, is just done for the convenience of university departments. Um, I don't think there's any real fundamental difference it's all about studying the world around us. Um, I think that we need to have very broad thinking uh, and perhaps people have become too specialized. I, I, I don't know. I think that, you know, I'm very reluctant to say in my day we were very broad and today the students are not. I think they're always the same, but I think the focus is, is, is perhaps different. Um, I think philosophy is incredibly important. Um, you know, I find myself almost every day going back to Socrates and saying, use your common sense and don't listen to what you're told. And I think that is a very, very powerful statement. And I think that uh, it, it's something, again, which is very important. I think spirituality is, is amazingly important. Um, I, you know, I, I, I guess I'm going to say very often how lucky I am. I feel that I have been so lucky throughout my life. And... Uh, one of the things I was lucky in is I have three sons, and the middle son got very, very involved in meditation. 
And after a long time, he persuaded me that I should meditate, and I do. And, you know, that 20 minutes of silence every day is an absolute lifesaver. So I think that things are complicated. And the way my son got me to do it, he said to me, oh, everything for you is rational. You think you know the answer to everything. Can you answer one question? So I said, sure. I'll answer all the questions. He said to me, where do your new ideas come from? I don't know where my new ideas come from. I don't know if anyone knows where their new ideas come from. And that suddenly made me realize that there's something beyond this. So I think all of these things now with AI, you know, AI is, is I mean, AI has been there for a long time. So let me ask, let me ask a question to the audience. So um, 10 years ago, a machine became the world champion at chess, maybe 15 years ago. And now I would imagine that your iPhone has enough computer power, your phone, your smartphone, to beat most of us at chess. So you might have thought that the conclusion would be chess is not an intellectual game, we shouldn't play it. But the effect is exactly the opposite. More and more people are playing chess because the computer can teach them good moves. So oftentimes what happens is not what you expect. So maybe, you know, I think that Take the other example that I gave before about finding your way. So the computer guidance system that I use and my favorite is Waze uh, basically has taught me a whole lot about the places where I live in. It's found routes that I would never have thought about. So I think it can be a symbiosis where smart smartphones, smart computers, AI can make us better. I would hope it's that way. I think that's the way it has to be. I think the, the depth of human existence of empathy, of warmth, of what we have inside us is so far beyond anything that AI can do. Maybe AI will be able to drive. It's certainly very good at long multiplication. I mean, the calculator you could buy 30 years ago was much better at long multiplication than any genius savant. So we have to realize what these things are telling us and appreciate them. But thank you for the question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, thank you, Professor Lavi, for for the fascinating uh, <laughs> discussion and uh, sharing. Uh, uh, I'm glad that we also uh, uh, brought uh, two uh, distinguished uh, guests up on stage as well. Uh, we have a Jonathan uh, Wizzo. Huh? I mean, but he's the he's the uh, uh, head of the uh, McKenzie Global Institute, very well-known institute, and they've done a lot of uh, research, study, reports, and a huge uh, uh, impact. I, I really uh, agree with what uh, Professor Lavin just said. It's, this COVID-19 serves as a, a stress test for, for, for all countries, actually, and also, uh, but, but also we're having 2020 as a very complex year with uh, many things going on. So. So I, I, I also we want to hear uh, Jonathan's perspective, but also uh, Ken. Uh, Ken Jerry is a former uh, president of the MCHAM Shanghai, but also you serve as a consul general here. You also uh, was the uh, now uh, the, uh, uh, in charge of uh, Madame Albright and the Bridgestone uh, operation in Shanghai. So both of you, I mean, after you hear what uh, our, our Lord Laurie just said, and, uh, but also giving your background and your thinking about uh, what's the uh, challenge you had, you know, from 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 uh, uh, you know both uh, business and uh, uh, you know the world in general, particularly, and and particularly also what's your take for the future direction, and also since all both of you are from American, China, and the U.S. Uh, to that expect as well. <laughs> Maybe Jonathan can start. Yeah, I, I get that feeling. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm going to leave the politics to you, uh, Ken. <laughs> okay. but, uh, the, um, no, I, I fully appreciate, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Levitt, for, for sharing and uh, the idea of, a, of COVID as a, as a stress test or, as we've been saying, an, an accelerant. Uh, it, um, under, not changing as much as, uh, as accelerating trends which were already at work. Um, which is, I think, you know, obvious, most obvious in the digitization 
of uh, daily life, as well as uh, business and some processes in, uh, in China that's come through in terms of the supply chain and you know, the way in which we've really taken a big step forward in automotive and chemicals elsewhere to bring small and medium-sized enterprises online and to, to connect them more. So it's been very real. Uh, but also, of course, uh, I think the consumer has changed, has matured a bit and uh, has grown up, if you will. We've seen savings rates go up in tier three, tier four cities. We've seen changes in, uh, again, an acceleration of trend around health and wellness and people trying to take care of themselves and making sure they know what's in the food that they're eating. And cleaning supplies went up quite a lot, actually, um, as far as the marketplace. Um, a couple other things. I, I think it has accelerated the winner-take-all environment uh, where the uh, people who could digitize and go online did faster and they gained share and as a result other companies uh, dropped out and so uh, it's a very Darwinian capitalism we live in China and so we've seen that uh, that continue and, and if anything accelerate uh, but against that um, we've also seen a rise in what we'll call public-private collaboration that compared to the last time uh, this happened in SARS or uh, any other sort of earthquake that there's just been a much greater role for the private sector in responding here, which I think has interesting implications because as soon as one sees that and says that, well, these technology firms, they are actually contributing, well, then they have an obligation. And so now the social contract is being expanded to include private companies. Uh, which I think is very meaningful for any company in China. They have now a new set of responsibilities, which they may not fully appreciate, but uh, I assure you they will going forward. Um, and, um, and finally, one of the things that's a little troubling is the regionalization of the world. We seem to, uh, this has definitely taken a toll on our interconnect and our ability to, to, to uh, put ourselves in other people's places, literally. Um, and with that as a growth of, of regional, regional philosophies, regional structures. And here in Asia, I think we see that most obviously because Asia is the center. It's clearly the center of the world economy, of the world marketplace, of the source of investment, of the growth of technology. Um, and uh, increasingly it is uh, Asia for Asia. And uh, just as it is a China for China. And uh, that is neither good nor bad. It's, uh, it sort of is what it is, if uh, we use a hackneyed phrase. But it does have implications, of course, because if Asia is the center of the world and it's increasingly Asian, then what does that leave the rest of the world? Ken? Well, thank you, Jonathan, for setting me up for the political content of, of this question. Uh, so sticking with the stress test uh, metaphor, uh, U.S.-China relations, of course, had been under a period of stress uh, well before COVID-19 arrived. And COVID-19, here too, it is a, a case of accelerating some of the existing trends because to the extent that in the United States you had growing suspicions or animosity that were building toward China, you know, part of this was based on uh, certain preconceptions about uh, China's openness or its transparency or its... Uh, its its role internationally as a fair or a fair player and COVID-19 uh, served to reaffirm many of the negative perceptions that people have in the United States. So in that sense, it certainly accelerated the tensions between the two governments. And then in terms of COVID-19 offering the international community an opportunity to work together, you know, here too we have to say that the international community didn't exactly pass you know, the stress test. Uh, whether it's you know, simply the role of the WHO or, of course, the U.S. attitude to the WHO is, it stands out as the U.S. kind of walked away from the WHO sort of at the height of this particular crisis. But there has been a tendency of countries around the world uh, first to secure their own PPE and their own equipment instead of the world sort of working together uh, at this particular time. So in that sense also, there was, I guess, in the, an unfortunate reminder of what human behavior is all like is like you know, when push comes to shove. So, uh, so this uh, sets us up for what is coming next. So I'll, I'll also put uh, a moratorium on myself in terms of the election, which we'll is have to wait a week. Uh, but uh, the election outcome, uh, to some degree, will be shaped by the COVID-19 experience in the United States. So whether or not uh, depending on your point of view as to the outcome. You know, if, for those of you in the audience who are hoping to see President Trump depart in January, 
So maybe you'll conclude that COVID-19 actually uh, was welcome if that was actually the silver lining of the COVID-19 experience for you. So uh, I just wanted to add to something that Jonathan had said, speaking here as a, as a biologist, um, there's a massive misunderstanding among almost everybody that Darwinism is survival of the fittest. It's very easy to see this. Um, we have two main life forms on Earth. Bacteria, which are called prokaryotes, and everything else that's called eukaryotes. So bacteria are very Darwinian in the sense of survival of the fittest. You know, one bacteria gets himself really shaped up, and then he passes all his genetic information exactly to his offspring. And if he is super fit, then his offspring are super fit. Now that was the first form of life that seems to have evolved on Earth. But about two billion years ago, evolution saw that it had a fatal flaw, and it fixed it. Now, one could make a joke here and say that the fatal flaw was there was no sex. Because essentially, if we look at every other life form except bacteria, there's a male and a female. And the male might have the best genes in the world, you know, in every single way. And the female might have their best genes in the world. But then the offspring each get a random half of their parents' genes. Now, if you think about that, you know, there's often jokes about, well, you know, my child has, you know, my brains and my wife's good looks and vice versa, and it's always very funny. But the fact is, it's real. So why did evolution make this massive shift? And the reason is diversity. It's also true that once evolution introduced sex, and it turns out that yeast, which is a single cellular organism, is advanced, but a bacteria, which might be the same size as a yeast cell, is backward. As soon as we evolved to have this diversity, all life around us evolved. Every flower, every tree, every animal, every bird, human, human brains. But before that, bacteria are single cells. They don't have diversity. Diversity was essential to create everything. So essentially, now why did nature, now you could argue, well, why did evolution want diversity? What does diversity get you? I mean, after all, you know, it's great having trees and flowers and everything else, but you know, diversity makes things complicated. Well, that's exactly why, and everyone in this room will know that what is the key thing about a good investment strategy is that it's diversified. So evolution realized two billion years ago that you cannot put all your eggs into the same basket. We need species, so human beings, or any other species, need to be as different from each other as possible so that they can still be part of the same breeding group, so that in a case of disaster, one particular group will survive. In a case of disaster, maybe your small investments in Bitcoin will pay for all the you know, great investments you made in other things. So this diversity is essential, and I think when you mentioned sort of a narrowing of diversity, winner takes all, winner takes all might be great, but it's the end of humanity. If we adopt a strategy where we basically say our country is for our people, the great strength of the country whose name I won't mention is diversity. There is no more diverse country on this earth, and that's its strength. And this needs to be a lesson to people who think that there's another rule there. The other thing about evolution, and in fact, uh, Professor Marjan Pang and I had a discussion with a very prominent geneticist at Fudan, and he basically said that it even goes further. You need to protect the weakest, because the weakest have the genes that are far out. You want to basically, because you need to have the richest gene pool you can ever have for times of disaster, just like you need to have the richest investment portfolio. You have to carry things with you that are losses, because one day they're going to be big leaders. So I think this is the real message. And remember, if it's an evolutionary message, it's worked for two billion years. And it's led, I and mean, just look around, it's led to all this diversity. So basically, this is something which everyone should know. And it should really guide your thoughts at every time. It's difficult. It should be important in education. You want to have the best, but you want to have diversity. You want to have people who are obedient, but you want diversity. And this, these are, this is an intrinsic conflict, and I think this is the big, big challenge going forward to appreciate this and to use it in a positive way.
Well, so good. And this is uh, from biodiversity to uh, world diversity. This is what CCG stands for, right? We want a diversity of uh, opinions. We want to have. Uh, but incidentally, I actually, yesterday, I uh, paneled a section. And this is for blockchain, cryptocurrencies. An audience or half of my age. And they were talking about decentralized, trustless, and uh, smart contracts. And that's a form of diversified into financial system. Now they call DeFi. So my question is from, for four of you is, how do we, in this after pandemic, keep this diversified ideas, or Asia for Asia, or China for China? How do you maintain that individualism at the same time uh, promote a global goal? Do we need AI for that? Are we going to see uh, the end of the tunnel for that? Please start from Gerald. Uh, so I think, so maybe it'll be easier than you think uh, in the sense, first we have to be in a situation in which international travel will become normal again. So it might require us to overcome certain psychological obstacles to Professor Levitt's point about the COVID-19 uh, perhaps not being as uh, traumatic or as it doesn't necessarily need to redefine the world. You know, that's a, a common expression that the world has changed. So perhaps it does require a mindset that in fact, it is possible to go back to uh, ways of behavior before. Um, but, and then I don't, in terms of AI, so I'll leave AI for others on the panel to see if that has a role. But in terms of the interaction and diversity, I guess my own feeling is it's naturally sort of resume. That people will have a hunger for that. Uh, those who are used to being global citizens. I mean, this is very much a trend of the world today and something that I don't feel is going to uh, be turned back. And I, I expect that there'll be sort of a very strong embrace. But at the same time, you know, we are in this period of history where there is this retrenchment and sort of populist movements are there. And, and for me, I would sort of see this in more of a historical cycle, you know, separate from COVID-19. But again, there's an interplay between the two. So we do, it's a period of time, I think, before we get over this current cycle of sort of populism and nationalism. Great. Jonathan, you want to start? Sure. Um, well, I mean, I was giving you the McKinsey view the last time. I'll give you mine now. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm an urbanist or a believer in cities. Is, uh, and I think we're basically carriers of a broader social collective organism that we represent at the period of time and that you know, we, uh, we manifest ourselves in this form and then go on, but the collective uh, is what enables us. And so there's really no contradiction between this idea that we can become more fully ourselves as we are more connected to each other. Uh, in fact, it's very hard to be fully yourself if you're not connected to other people. Um, living alone in the desert is very difficult. There's, a, there's not a lot of resources around. So how will you actually become yourself? In the same way, if we cut ourselves off from the flows of pretty much anything, whether it's money, capital, data, information, other people, uh, the nature, yes, you're poorer for it and you have less capacity to, to reify yourself. So there is no contradiction here. And the people who are sort of making that case are essentially, essentially trying to put one over on everybody else because they're saying everybody should be cut off except for me, that I would like to be the gatekeeper. I would like to control this in the interests of all of us, but let me make the decisions. I genuinely do not trust those people um, because uh, that is what we call monopolistic behavior in a marketplace, and we know what that gets you. Um, that gets you a monopoly. And so uh, I don't think that's in anyone's interest. So I, I would strongly encourage us to, as you said, I think there is a, people have been hurt, and it's not by COVID, it's been hurt by the way in which capitalism has developed over the last 30 years. Uh, and this has, uh, this has created a very strong backlash. And we have a lot of people who are, in the Buddhist expression, uh, conveying a tragic expression of self. Uh, they are, in many ways, reacting to things that have happened to them. And uh, that, unfortunately, the way they're expressing that is causing more hurt as well. 
Uh, so, but we need to acknowledge that. We need to actually express our, our understanding, our empathy, and to engage in what it can be the only path forward, which is the collective path. There is no, there's no uh, Ayn Rand version of the, of the human race. It does not exist. It's always been a myth that always will be. The, we, we exist as a collective. We work together. In the immortal words of Mark Twain, naked people have very little influence on society. Um, we are only able to make progress in as much as we listen and work together. So I'm sure that there will be two steps forward, one step back. We're probably in a half a step back for some dimensions here. Uh, but that's not, uh, but, you, know, and, you know, I am an optimist because what's the point of being anything else? I just, I just want to add I, regarding Michael's question. I, I think that uh, absolutely, you know, I mean, this pandemic has really, you know, <laughs> tested the hu all human beings. And of course, uh, uh, it's a really huge test to the 21st century, the global structure and global governance. And I, I found that actually through this pandemic, we are actually dependent more on each other rather than the country. So, uh, you know, we, we realize, uh, you know, maybe no country is, uh, is island, we cannot uh, separate from the world, and then we really have to fight uh, together. Rather, it, it's really silly to fight among ourselves. When we're facing the, you know, world wires war, basically, we have to really control the pandemic. And uh, so, so I think I, I agree was uh, that we, we can't just think of Asia for Asia or China for China and things like that. We really have to think in the, you know, in a global sense. So I think the dual circulation uh, strategy that proposed by, by China, which I understand, is actually a, a more involvement. It's like a bicycle. You, you got to have a two wheel drive. You know, you, you know, you can't missing one, one wheel of that. And uh, really, that if you, if you have the domestic circulation well, then you can stimulate the international uh, demand and the international circulation on the, and, and, and back again to uh, stimulate China. So, so I think that's probably, uh, we have to see more Close, uh, close connectivity, but more open uh, for, for China. So, so I think in that sense, uh, this pandemic has really showed that uh, we have to uh, work together and we have to help each other. And we really, uh, use, these days you cannot have a, have a nuclear war or, or, or a world war, a third world war. From the mutual assured destruction to mutual assured dependency is really the, the path to go. So, so I think that's what I, I really heard, and I think this has proven that we have to do. I, I, I see that uh, uh, Russell Flannery, uh, of, uh, of, uh, chief editor of Forbes China, is here. Maybe you, you can share uh, your comment or questions, maybe, <laughs> just, just for all of us. We come late. Yeah, thanks for, uh, for putting me on the spot, Henry. <laughs> uh, uh, my own, uh, well, I just got back to China on October 4th uh, after I left in January oh, yeah. uh, and uh, cleared through some visa hurdles and other things. So uh, it's been, a, it's been a, an odyssey around Asia and uh, the U.S. Uh, this year for me and probably some others in the room. Um, my feeling about the world is that we are actually um, entering a period of uh, rapid change over the next two or three years. And, uh, um, and I agree with much of what's been said about uh, uh, the, the, the importance of community. Um, and I think we'll see some redefinition of communities and uh, the technology that brings different communities together. So, um, my impression is that uh, there will be uh, great flows of capital uh, that will follow the, uh, the great uh, increases in money supply and debt uh, that we're seeing around the world. And uh, uh, when we come out of this, it, it will not be a short-term thing. There'll be some profound uh, differences in the way people entertain themselves. Uh, and uh, interact with family and other members of communities. So how that all that plays out on the international level at the end, uh, of course, is a fascinating question. Uh, I see China as emerging uh, increasingly as a technology leader in the world based on its capital uh, and human resources and uh, the kind of social preferences and social patterns of, 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 of Chinese 
culture that we see in Chinese culture. So uh, in terms of the engagement between China and the world and the US and the world, um, I think that we'll see many new kind of win-win interesting um, um, things evolving uh, that are as hard to foresee with clarity today as we could foresee six months ago. But uh, from my own conversations with business people in the US and business people around Asia that I've had the chance to unexpectedly cross paths with uh, this year, uh, I, I, I think it, you know, the creativity of the human mind will bring itself forward in new ways. And, and we'll look back and see this as an interesting unleashing of a lot of new ideas that, that were not there uh, only in January. So I'm kind of optimistic, and, and, and of course, obviously it's a tremendous human tragedy, particularly in the U.S., but I, my sense is that uh, there'll be a lot of, you know, there'll be a lot that will come out of it, and as, as, uh, as uh, Professor Levitt uh, just mentioned, uh, you know, the, the human spirit will carry on in new ways. Thanks. So, nice to see you again. Nice to um, see you too. Basically, I think that it's interesting, we were in quarantine for two weeks, and then we came out during the autumn New Moon Festival. And the contrast between seeing nobody and suddenly seeing people was quite amazing. I remember my first meal at a round table was like, all these faces, all these people. So I think it may end up having the opposite effect. I think human interactions are incredibly important. My wife and I actually tried ourselves to keep normal. We spent the whole of August traveling around Europe, which was very difficult. It was greatly aided by all my different passports and a marriage certificate. But we managed to go from Israel, a very red country, to England, to Portugal, to Germany, to England, and back to Israel without even one day of quarantine or a COVID test. So I guess uh, that says something about the system. Um, I think that one question I wanted to raise here, and I think it's an important one. I, I am a great believer in globalism. You know, I, it doesn't take very much to realize that we face global problems. And, uh, you know, I, I think that in some ways globalism is the ultimate form of human togetherness, of human expression. And I think it's, it's wonderful. Um, but one thing that does worry me, and that is that uh, the, the issue of inequality. So I am very aware in myself that I am only here by luck. It wasn't that I used my luck. I never chose what sperm and what egg would make me. I never chose any of this. From my point of view, it is pure, total, random luck. Any one of us could do an exchange experiment, be anybody else, either dead or alive. Now, we're lucky of all the bad things that haven't happened to us. It, up till now, I didn't die at age one, I didn't die at age two, I didn't have a car accident. You can make a long list of things and in probability, there's a kind of way you calculate what there is by saying what there isn't. And it's a long multiplication of all the things that didn't happen. So any one of us is incredibly lucky. And it's not that we deserve the luck, but somebody had to be lucky. And unfortunately, somebody else had to be unlucky. So one thing I was very concerned about is, is there a way that AI can make the distribution of good luck less wide? So right now, there are some people who are unbelievable. I mean, I have been so lucky. I have been, I was lucky to find my wife after my first wife died, literally. You know, you would not believe how lucky I am. And I wouldn't count on that because luck is something you don't ever count on, but I'm very lucky. Other people have been much less lucky. The one thing I thought it would be, this is gonna sound absolutely crazy, but it's something that, so we, we a basic income kind of is worrying. Negative income tax may be okay. The trouble is all of these schemes can be gained. Somebody will find a way to, you know, make money who maybe don't deserve it. But now just imagine going into the future a time when thanks to surveillance, iPhones, everything else, everything about you is known to some central computer. Your WeChat account as well, or your Alipay account. And basically if something bad happens to you, you suddenly win the lottery. Unconnected, at least as far as you know, but actually connected. Or suddenly, you, there's a tax mistake in your advantage. Do you imagine a computer controlling everything, 
And its main aim is to narrow the distribution, make the less fortunate more fortunate and so on. And I think we have a real problem here. There's a movie which maybe some of you have seen, it wasn't a really famous movie, based on the Kurt Vonnegut book, uh, Harrison Bergeron. And this is a dystopia where after many world wars, they decide that the way you have to avoid conflict is to make everybody equal. And you can't make them equally smart, but you can make them equally dumb. You can't make somebody a really good dancer, but you can break the legs of a good dancer. So it's a society which basically tries to bring everything down. Now, you know, and, and people wear headbands, and as soon as you start to think, a very loud noise gets played and spoils it. Now, in the end, it all breaks down because there's a small subclass that's running all of this behind the scenes. But that is very scary, but it does raise the problem that inequality at some level leads to conflict. Now, you can always imagine that, you know, we will all be flying into our gated communities, in our private electric planes, and everything will be delivered to us, and we will never walk down the street, because the street will be a scary place to be. But that, for me, is a real dystopia. And I would much rather have a smaller income disparity. It has to be something, instead of being the best, the super, the richest, and everyone else being miserable. And I think this is something which really is, for the world, a problem we have to face. I think this and global climate change are the two really hard problems. And I think these are problems that I have no idea what the solution is, but we need every single smart person in the world, the young ones, really thinking about solutions to these problems. Well, so stimulating to think about it. So uh, I, I think we have uh, another 20 minutes. So let us open for, since I only get one note. So I think people, uh, to ask direct questions. Please state your name and the company you come from if you, uh... thank you, Bing. Hi, my name is Bing Zhou, I'm from PwC. I have a question for our American friends. We have a, uh, three very- Which Americans? Uh, three of them. Maybe Mr. Grant is also American. <laughs> okay, and what's, what's your view about China-US relationship? Are we in a cold war? If not, what's your prediction for the future of China-US relationship? Thank you. Jerry, you want to take that? Yeah. That's not a question. You, you don't want to wait until next week to tackle this question? Um, well, uh, so uh, briefly put, because that's a very big question. It's, uh, it's a relevant one. Uh, so the two countries are undergoing a structural change in how the relationship is viewed and managed. Uh, the approach in the past, which had, was weighted more in the direction of cooperation, even with a tinge of competition, that was always there. Now, this is, at least from the U.S. perspective, this is being redefined now as something that is heavier on the competition side, uh, weighted toward adversarial or even antagonistic or hostile. And, and this is, while you might feel that this is a feature this has come to the fore during the Trump administration, but it's important to keep in mind that this is not something that the Trump administration created all uh, sort of on its own. So this will be something that will be with us moving forward, regardless of who's in the White House up to next week's election. So for the two uh, countries or the two governments, uh, they need to find a new logic for the relationship. So this is why at the moment, if you feel that we're floundering around and neither side is tethered to anything in particular, it's because that's the case. Uh, we need to find a new rationale. Uh, uh, what is the right mix of competition and cooperation? Uh, we, we there to one extreme. I do feel that this will moderate a bit. Even if we have a second Trump administration, I would argue that we would see an adjustment in their policy toward China. Uh, but that's, so moving forward, uh, so it's hard to, I wouldn't be too optimistic about the relationship if by optimism you are looking for a very happy relationship in which we have simply uh, cooperation because you know, China is in a different place, the United States is in a different place, so there's a lot of uh, suspicion uh, toward each other and this is, I would argue, a, a more permanent feature of the landscape now in terms of U.S.-China relations. But, but hopefully some of these extremes of point of view can be moderated and we can you know, look for those areas where the two governments can work together and that will be reaffirming to the populations in the two countries that there is actually value 
in having these two great countries work together wherever possible. Should go in order. Um, so I would like to look at this from a slightly different point of view, um, historically. In some ways, I see the interaction between the US and China today as being similar to the interaction between Europe and the USA in the 30s and 40s. One way you can see this is uh, by looking at Nobel Prizes. And uh, it's very difficult to know actually who discovers what. But the Nobel Committee really, really tries hard to go back to all the original papers to see who does what. So counting Nobel Prizes is one way to say where there was innovation. And before 1940, um, Europe had 80% of the Nobel Prizes and the USA had 20%. And the economies were probably quite similar. The USA was very good at adapting technology. Motor cars were invented in Europe, but Henry Ford found out how to make them. Uh, Tesla was very important coming from Europe in electricity, but again, the USA was able to apply them. So the USA was taking technology found elsewhere and applying it. Then in some ways, for the USA's point of view, a good thing happened. It was a terrible thing for the whole world and that was the rise of Nazi Germany. Nothing did more for American science than Adolf Hitler. That one man pushed United States science from being one quarter of the world to being more than one half of the world. It's seen in Nobel Prizes, it's seen in the people who made the satellites, it's seen in people like von Neumann with computers. Basically, US's openness, when compared to the closeness of Europe as Europe went into trouble, had a major beneficial effect for USA. And for the world, it was also good, because instead of that science being lost, it was pushed forward. And it's also part of a much longer cycle. If you look historically, 5,000 years ago, I bet the best science might have been in China. And then it moved, like the sun, towards the West, India, Arabian countries, ancient Egypt, ancient Greece, Europe, then United States. And maybe it's coming around again. But I don't want that world where we basically, one is winning and the others are losing. So I think that is the alternative. Science will not be lost. It will be lost to the USA. So the USA has a very, very serious challenge. The USA also has the challenge to realize that what makes it great is its diversity. If the USA was not diverse, and you just look at this, the USA has more Nobel Prizes for people not born in the USA by a huge factor. Certain countries have lost Nobel Prizes. Germany, Austria, Poland, have people born there who didn't get the Nobel Prize there. The USA has 25% of its Nobel Prizes from people who weren't born there. And as a joke, one way that China can get a lot of Nobel Prizes is allow dual citizenship. This is something that the USA does, UK does, Israel does. So this is a very easy way to share a Nobel Prize. Let somebody of Chinese extraction keep his Chinese citizenship. This might not seem patriotic, but it's a great way to boost the number of Nobel Prizes. Uh, not much to add. I totally agree with what you just said about diversity and the, uh, I worry for China on that ground. I just feel like that uh, is, uh, if we, specifically I worry for Chinese football um, that uh, sort of the microcosm of the of the of the challenge of integrating global talent, um, but um, yeah, no. Uh, the thing is that um, I mean, I, I guess my one thing is that yeah, whatever we're in, we're in it, and you should not expect that to change for the next uh, decade or two. Uh, that uh, this is uh, underpinned by the long-term rise of China as a urbanizing middle class uh, consumer innovation driven uh, economy and society and that doesn't turn around for you know a good couple of decades um, and at the same time you have Kishore Mabubani writing about you know America's having a hard time being number two um, so yeah I, I think that there's the, there's just a lot more mm, journal articles to be written on this <laughs> so but that said no, I, I, again, I don't necessarily think conflict is always a bad thing. In fact, it's how we evolve and how we figure out what's better. Uh, and uh, so it's what's, what, we mat what matters is resilience. 
Uh, so we need to be better at resilience. We need to have better measures of where the risks are and to uh, hopefully avoid some of them and uh, where you don't and where you make a judgment and you invest appropriately and have a better uh, so supply chain to handle all that. Uh, you know, diversify, as we mentioned, your financing, your, your technology sources, your talent. I mean, as, uh, as people who are in the business of supporting development, that's the natural response and you have. Uh, so this is uh, not necessarily bad news uh, unless it is uh, really bad news. And so we should try to avoid, obviously, the catastrophic outcomes for things that sink all the boats, like climate change, uh, like, uh, like a much more devastating version of a pandemic. I mean, there, there, there are public goods that we should try to find a way of collaborating on. And uh, one hopes that uh, we can see all of that. But if we don't, well, then we'll get the consequences of that too. So um, the, uh, you know, be, uh, be aware. We're gonna look back on the 90s and the 2000s of this time and like, wow, that was so peaceful. I mean, we had no, no idea what, that, you know, what the world really was because uh, that was the illusion. Stability was the illusion. This is the reality. People keep talking. I just want to. People keep talking about a post-COVID world. What is this post? You're in it. Why do you think this would change? So you know, let's make it better. You know, we've already, we have a new context. Let's figure out how to make it better. So enjoy your lunch while you can, right? <laughs> Harry, you want to? Yeah, I, I'll just add some Chinese perspective, probably, you know, since our American friends has just said. What, what I think, actually, there is quite a bit of a global a governance is falling behind global practice. You know, we, I mean, after Second World War, we saw the emerging of the multinational corporation operates worldwide. But I think the structure to really manage multi corporation within each country is still falling behind. WHO, you know, Doha Run hasn't been really effective for the last 20 years. And uh, so we see multinational is really getting uh, very active around the world, but then they are making all the, all the, all the profits as well. I think the, both the home country and the host country doesn't really benefit that much. I mean, one good example is we often heard 1% of Wall Street is almost equal to 50% of a mass general population. So in that kind of context, populism, deglobalization, it all comes back. And China is doing so well in, in terms of KPI among uh, you know, 100, 200 countries. So easily, since it has a different ideology, it has been really an easy scapegoat to, you know, like many good examples. I mean, why a Apple from China has only made a 2,000 bucks, but then selling for $1,000. And then, and then on the X, F FBI or CIF, China probably uh, credited for 600 on that. So, so this is really, I mean, the... President Trump has actually deepened that perception, you know, by saying many times <laughs> China is ripping U.S. and things like that. And then that really, I think that kind of problem of massive social media, you know, coupled with that, is we really need the multilateralism to come back. So I, I was really proposing, I wrote an op-ed op at the Financial Times just a week ago. I'm calling for climate G G10, you know, G7 plus China, India, and Russia, which... So it can bring the population from 10% to 50% of the world representation. And the six largest uh, carbon emission countries will be included. And also we should have a three-party talks, US, EU, and China, so that we'll have a mediator. If two guys fight, we really need somebody to, 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 to really set everybody aside. So I think we really need international efforts to really to uh, a more advance the global governance structure to cope with the 20th century global governance structure, world multinational business, you know, e-commerce, digital economy, operates on the 21st wild you know, west. There's no, there's no rules around. There's no digital currency. There's no digital tax. So all those things, we will keep stimulating all those questions, pressures for the politician, UN. Yet, you know, China is the easiest target. So probably that explains some of the... the Dilemma we are in. But of course, China needs also to up, upgrade its narrative. I mean, the narrative has been using, I, I would say, very traditional, <laughs> very, very traditional and really innovate. And find a language that internationally understand and really, uh, you know, commutes well, rather than we go back to the conveniently the old uh, 
narrative. So, so narrative innovation, the new theory for China to explain why you're doing so well. It really need to be explained. I mean, like uh, Professor Lavin just said, I mean, the diversity, right? I mean, the world is not just one polar world. We're, we're probably multipolar, but then what's the, you know, why is not the end of history? Uh, Fukuyama sounds serious. So why, why, why we should, can we have a peaceful competition or healthy, uh, like, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Joseph and I just told me that maybe we should have a healthy uh, cooperative competition. That's the term he used. Maybe we should do that. So uh, just my humble opinion, thank you. Okay, so one more question. Oh, Bailey. Uh, Mike, please. Thank you, my name is Billy and I work for Shanghai Municipal People's Government. In my line of work, I channel through messages from leadership of Shanghai to business leaders from around the world. And since this event happens in Shanghai, I think it makes sense to gauge wisdom from such a distinguished panel that are pertinent to Shanghai, the city that I love. So my first question is, in order for Shanghai to gain a head start in this area of digital transformation, what elements are missing currently? My second question is, in order, Shanghai is gaining prestigious on the global stage in terms as a international metropolis. What things need to be avoided for Shanghai in order to advance into the future? Thank you. Great questions. You all live in Shanghai, you all love Shanghai, right? So. Those are really big questions. Um, so, well, I mean, China is the world's greatest urban experiment. So, uh, and nobody knows what a billion Chinese people in cities looks like. Uh, so there's a lot of uncertainty or, you know, it's, it's all, that's all my way of caveating everything I'm going to say. Um, so, and of course we love Shanghai. You know, this is uh, one of the world's great cities. Um, Speaking as a Shanghainese, you say it is the world's greatest city. Actually, I think the track record over the last 30 years, there's no other city which has done what Shanghai has done. Um, when I came here, we had about eight or nine million people, and uh, now we're up to 23 or 24. Uh, GDP per capita was somewhere in the five, six thousand dollar range. Today, it's up to 25,000. You know, the, you can't that that those numbers don't show up anywhere else on this planet um, ever in the history of mankind. So. Yay for Shanghai. So now we're going to Shanghai 2.0 or whatever number you want. Um, that's uh, the digital part. And I have no doubt that you know, the same, a lot of the same underlying principles need to apply here. And that what the city is very good at um, is, uh, is sandboxing, it's, it's piloting stuff. It's, uh, it's, it's not always on the cutting edge. I think it's fair to say that Shanghai is intrinsically conservative in some ways. I prefer to see it work somewhere else as opposed to being the guys who invent it. And there's a, I think we need to make sure that Shanghai keeps that spirit of invention to, to study the South, the Shen, 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 or whatever. I mean, but to bring that in, it's been very good at leveraging global talent. And I think that's where Shanghai can be even more, uh, and I think can, can others add on to this, but, you know, pilots around how does, how does global talent integrate into Shanghai? I think there's, there's a lot there. Uh, which includes global intellectual talent and capital for that talent and sort of ensuring that uh, inventors and academics have the full rights to their innovations um, and that uh, that can be something that uh, the Shanghai stands for and and creates a uniquely uh, friendly environment to uh, for both investors and academics um, that um, and I think as far as the technology and the hardware goes well you know this is a this is not the problem in that sense. I mean, that there, there's quite a lot of uh, capacity to invest here. I don't doubt that. You know, we're, we're going to find uh, deployment of all versions of IoT very quickly. I do think that, that the social contract needs to be carefully managed. I think that, uh, you know, we in Shanghai, we always talk about the way Waikai found. Well, actually, I mean, opening the outside world. But Shanghai, Shanghai honestly needs a little more Dwayne Kai Fang. Um, that uh, the integration of uh, the Chinese people, uh, the rest of China in Shanghai is equally, if not more important. And how to ensure a healthy social environment um, from housing. You know, there's no possibility for factory workers in Shanghai to buy their own homes. Um, that will not happen in their lifetimes. 
uh, that is uh, that is a that is a difference between the context of what Shanghai has experienced historically and where we are today. And uh, we as a society in Shanghai will have to solve that. I think technology can play a role in doing that in digital transformation. There's there's lots of ways to rethink the home, the house, and and the financing thereof. So all that is uh, just to say, I think that we have a lot of opportunity here, and Shanghai should uh, take confidence in the track record that it's built, and to continue to pilot and to expand, particularly around policy, uh, to uh, engage with the outside world and be truly be China's window onto onto the onto the onto the, onto the world. I think I finished the first question. I think that's probably as much as I can say. <laughs> I'll just add one very specific point, since you did mention digitization which would be to recommend that Shanghai ease up on its internet restrictions. Now, this is something that's mentioned to the Shanghai government often, and it's not an issue that they actually have control over, but perhaps there could be some experiment in Shanghai, uh, because it's a, it's a challenge for entrepreneurial talent, for small uh, companies that want to come here that, are, uh, that use a Google-based uh, software. Uh, China does tolerate the use of VPNs, so in that sense they recognize that people have a need to access information that's on the forbidden list and they allow that. So why not actually go one step further and to create some kind of an internet free zone and see how that goes. I think that, China, that Shanghai or China would survive fine if they tried that experiment. So, uh, two things, I thought that Jonathan's answer was amazing in its detail and its comprehensiveness and it seems to me that uh, just wonderful to hear that i thought there was nothing to add then you actually added something and uh, you know the uh, well it is something that would be a good idea and i do very much like the scientific approach to social issues by doing experiments in different areas and i think it's something which could make a lot of sense i think the two points that stand out most in my mind from these Great question. One is maybe a internet, an internet-free zone. The other is the point that you raised about the social contract, the inter, inter, in, you know, the integration with the rest of China. I think all of these are are very important. But nothing else to add. Well, I think uh, on behalf of CCG uh, and uh, maybe on behalf of all of you, let's give another applause for Professor and all. Of people on the stage. I think we have uh, come from a very diversified background and we all happen in Shanghai. I know lots of friends are uh, from different, born different places also come uh, to Shanghai. I think I, I, my, I learned is hope and diversified over hope. And uh, let's hope for a better future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, um, uh, Michael, for wonderful moderation. And uh, one more thing I want to add is uh, coffee. I'm going to create my Starbucks, try the local coffee. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, what a fascinating uh, session. And uh, last but not least, I would like to invite the general manager of Shanghai Town of City Club, uh, Mr. Mado, to say a few words. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for this great introduction. So I let first the picture taken on. Here we go. All right, thank you. Thank you, everyone. So thank you very much for giving me a few minutes uh, to, um, to, of course, introduce uh, this place, Shanghai Town and Country Club. But uh, before that, I would like to thank very much uh, CCG organization and the leaders of CCG for choosing Shanghai Town and Country Club for hosting, of course, this great event. We are very, very happy to have you here with us. And, um, and of course, we hope you're enjoying your lunch, you're having a great time. Um, so, Shanghai Town and Cantor Club, it's a family private membership club and uh, I thought instead of using words to introduce our club, maybe a short video can give you a little bit more, of course, insight 
of the lifestyle that we provide to our members in Shanghai Town and Country Club. Let's see it all together. There's some logistics before that.